Hello, Kerry. Hi, Georgie. Hi. <laughs> We've been looking forward to this, haven't we? We have. We've really been looking forward to yeah. it. <laughs> and just to chat together again is, is part of it, isn't it? When we, you're yeah. down in the southwest, I'm up in the north of England. Um, so it's nice to c catch up and then see what you're doing as well. Um, now, I know we'll, what we'll do is we'll just sort of generally chat until a few people join us. Um, we end up, it's going to be recorded anyway, so people will be able to watch it afterwards anyway. Um, but, yeah, uh, I've put the messages out into my community. And so hopefully right. some people will be able to join us live. And if not, then hopefully they'll be watching this on the replay. So That's hello, it. anyone from Happy Healthy Pain Free. <laughs> Excellent, great. <laughs> That's a good good way to call it. Happy, healthy, yeah. pain free. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so, do you, would you want to start off then, Kerry, just telling us a bit about you? Because you, you've trained at Serpa, mm -hmm. um, and just you know why you did come to do our training and what how it's changed the way you're working. Because you, like me, are, are a physiotherapist. So, and I know you have other things, other strings to your bow as well. So, uh, how's it changed what you're doing and what else you've started using as well? Yeah, thanks, Georgia. Yeah, that's a great question. So um, I'm a physiotherapist, as you said, and I used to work in a busy London uh, hospital working on intensive care wards and in children's physiotherapy. And I, I realise now, looking back, that life was quite stressful. <laughs> there was a lot of things going on and I wasn't necessarily looking after myself in the way that would uh, best serve me so um, I was very much into sports and um, and I would run to work so I was I was work living at Tower Bridge near Tower Bridge and then I was running to Camberwell so like three four miles doing a whole day at work on the busy units and things and then I might run home go to the gym do a spin class do some abs and one day yeah one day I felt something go in my in my back in my thoracic spine and that was it. That was me on my on my pain management journey. And, wow. and I thought that, you know, I'm a physio. I've, I've got this. Physios aren't supposed to have pain or yeah, I just I can treat this. <laughs> <laughs> and so and so I did. And so I, I went on that journey. It started with physiotherapy and I had MRI scans and X-ray scans and um saw osteopaths and chiropractors and acupuncturists and Reiki masters. I did all of the diets and the exercise programs and it was it everything helped a bit you know everything worked a little bit but it was still there that like it just wouldn't go away and so um i decided i needed to learn more i needed to study more and so i traveled around the world learning from doctors and researchers and scientists in functional medicine Right. So I learned about nutrition and exercise and supplements and how to heal from all sorts of things. But no one was talking about pain. Oh. No one was talking I, over and above, you know, kind of take magnesium or do these exercises, all the things that I already knew and I'd already tried. Mm. Um, and so it was really when a colleague of mine mentioned the work of Dr. Sarno and I Googled a bit and then I found Serpa. And it was like a light bulb moment. Suddenly everything made sense. And it was very clear to me that this was the training that I needed to do. And 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 that's really how how my my practice of of because by this point I was trained in functional medicine and yoga and I was meditating and doing nutrition and taking supplements. And I realized that all of that was very unmanageable for me and for my clients. No, no right. one can keep up with trying to do everything doing everything exactly yeah. when you're not really understanding what's at the root of it yeah and so i think really what i learned through my work with serpo and through training with serpo is that everything can be guided from that root cause mm. and so once we understand the root cause of what's happening with somebody then breath work or yoga or nutrition they we, we can go off in those different areas if they're if if that's what you know that's what's needed yeah. But until you understand and treat what's at the root of it, then, yeah, then, mm. then we're kind of chasing our tails. And so really that's how my working with SERP has really, really affected what I do. Right. And then now you very much practice in this way, don't you? Yes. 
Yeah, yeah. So I only work now with um, resolution of chronic pain and other mind body conditions. And physically, um, face to face or online or both groups? I work, I, yeah, I do it all. So <laughs> I, I work online mainly and, mm -hmm. and I support a community of people inside the Happy, Healthy, Pain Free Facebook group. Mm -hmm. And also I'm at Route to Relief on, on Instagram. So I have people reach out to me through those channels. And you can, you can add those links when we finished here. Everybody will. Oh, cool. add yeah, that would be great. Yeah. Yeah. And so I, I, I support people in those ways. And then um, I have programs, so pain recovery programs, and I work with people one to one. Mm -hmm. But also here in Froome, I'm just um, finishing up my TRE provider education right. so yeah, yeah so um, releasing exercise yes exactly so trauma releasing exercise i've done some today in fact most you? days i will i will use tre yeah love it how do you it's find real, it i love it it's just a real way to physically just release pent-up emotions and i try to keep on top of things by doing it sort of five minutes while i'm lying in the bed in the morning for example uh, mm -hmm. i also found it really helpful when my father was dying um and uh, and after he died just just as a way of releasing how i was feeling uh, so i found yes. that really good journaling as well and all the other stuff we do but actually as a physical release especially as i was stuck indoors a lot being there supporting my parents i found it a really lovely way to just release um, yeah people that i work with with tre they they find it a little bit weird, like a little bit mm -hmm. strange. Sometimes like my body's just doing it. It's just, and so yes. TRE, um, people that don't know about TRE, it's where we elicit the body's natural tremor response in order to release um, tension and trauma that's um, stored in the body. Mm -hmm. And so it's a very gentle, very natural um, process, but the body kind of just does it on its own. And, um, mm -hmm. And that can be a little bit strange, but also very calming. And, um, yeah. and interestingly, um, actually, Kerry, as an example, before my father died, there was something really horrendous that happened um, late at night. Um, and I remember ringing a friend of uh, my father's who was a GP who just said, ring at any time. And I actually rang him. And he was he gave me advice, but he was there, my support in that time. And he, I was on the phone. He couldn't see anything. but the low half of my body was just literally doing that. And I just allowed it to, because I knew that this was my body just processing the fear, the trauma that had, had been happening. And I was able to let that flow through me rather than try and stop it. Um, and that was a completely natural thing. I didn't deliberately lie down and do any TRE. Uh, I literally just let my body um, allowed it to release uh, physically. And I find it really helpful. Um, for example, if something's happened, that's upset me in some way often it's you're more aware of the impact anger has aren't you you'll feel mm. that anger that you're bottling up um or that's been triggered uh and for me i very much need a need a physical release as well as uh, an emotional release so in other words or to release it emotionally physically as well as like through journaling so i might journal but i also might find it really helpful to just lie down and allow myself to get in the position and just let myself shake maybe even then go off for a run depends how big an event it's been um but physically can really help to release some of these emotions as well can't it yeah absolutely and even doing it so you might go for the run and then do the, the tre afterwards yes and that way the running is really primed the body Priming it, yes yeah, to, to, to yeah. go into that that natural response Definitely. great i just want to say hello to people who've joined us by the way and if you'd like to pop a, a comment in the box say hello or uh, if you've got anything you want to discuss question pop it in the box we have we have been thinking about what to talk in fact we I remember a while ago you said what what are we going to talk about what's how does this go and generally we go with the flow um but the topic that's come up uh hi Alison, hi, Alison. <laughs> you don't need to worry about being late you didn't have to say it we wouldn't have known <laughs> <laughs> um but yes, so I, as I mentioned in my newsletter yesterday, and there's been quite a bit of interest from that, um, the the topic of pelvic pain, pelvic conditions, yeah. like endometriosis, uh, polycystic ovary, ovary syndrome, and various other pelvic syndromes. Um, 
and linked with trauma, childhood trauma. Um, and it's something I've been asked a few times in this last week or so. I'm often emailed by people um, for advice. And, and, and that's what inspired me to then write the uh, newsletter, especially as um, I'd come across some, a, st- a couple of studies as well. Uh, and so I think you then mentioned it, didn't you, after the newsletter went out and you then emailed and said, why don't we talk about this? So hence, we will. Yeah. <laughs> It's really um, not well known that um, that many of these um, hormonal issues and um, things like polycystic ovaries, things like um, fibroids and things like that can can be impacted by trauma and stress in in our lives. And so I think it's really important to raise awareness about, about that for people. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and I think maybe d- d- when we start with this, I always need to keep my glasses near because sometimes I can't read what's actually on the screen, but then I don't usually wear my glasses in the office. Um, yeah, just to clarify, um, when we talk about tr- uh, trauma, generally when people think about trauma, they think about um, a sort of physical, emotional, sexual abuse, whereas it's not just that. It's anything uh, that c- creates a response within us that we don't process. And, and I actually pulled up what Gabo Mate, Dr. Gabo Mate says about Yeah, I love this quote. I love this. And I thought, well, let's make sure I get it word perfect. So um, as he says, trauma is a psychic wound that hardens you psychologically that then interferes with your ability to grow and develop. Um, trauma is not what happens to you. It's what happens inside of you as a result of what happened to you. And that's why people can face the same trauma. Some might be traumatized by it or the same stress or whatever it is. And some might not, depending on what it is. Mm-hmm. But we respond in a different way. Some may be, may be able to have that um, post-traumatic growth where they evolve from that and become stronger from that having processed it all. Other people might not have processed any of it and it's stuck there and it's unresolved. and is is creating this psychic wound that we then try and protect ourselves from even going there. Um, so we've got, so so that somebody might be sexually abused, but how we respond to that depends on each indiv- individual person. Um, but there's also small teas. Do you want to talk about small teas, Kerry? Yeah, so in our everyday lives, we are kind of constantly um, exposed to stress, and so I think let's let's if we look at stress and, and trauma as, as as separate things. But so this kind of stress of day to day life, and so whether it be um, you know just the demands of, of of living and finances and caretaking for children and things, but then there's also other traumas that we'll experience. So whether it be that we've been in a car accident or we've been um, uh, there's been some kind of broken bone if we, you know, if we've fallen over and, and you know, that's, that can be traumatic. Mm-hmm. Um, then there's the trauma that we, that we undergo because of grief and loss, whether we've lost a, a parent or a loved one or a, a pet. Mm-hmm. Things that we've witnessed can yeah. be traumatic. Um, yeah. Things that we witness on television on a day-to-day basis can be incredibly traumatic and it's, it can be this kind of drip, drip, drip effect. And depending on our general resilience, which is kind of um, pulled from all different factors from, you know, our childhood and our life circumstances and, um, you know, just our behaviours and how we learn things, our beliefs. Mm. All of these things can have a different effect on us. And so I feel like... Um, there's we we might not be um giving the trauma itself you know we're not calling it trauma because it's just life it's, it, these are life events uh, but they can be recognized you know they can be traumatic and they can be stored in the body and over time mm-hmm. that build up and and not addressing it not wanting to look at it can have an effect on us physiologically Absolutely. And if we think back to childhood, <clears throat> it can be uh, things that we might perceive to be normal. Um, and yet they create this, uh, a, a, can create a traumatic response within us. Or it's the little things that build up. It's like Gabamati, again, his book, The Myth of Normal, talks about these things, uh, 
think just because things are normal doesn't mean they're right. So, for example, um, sending a, a, a child uh, to a bedroom, you know, uh, mm. time out, uh, the naughty step, that sort of thing, uh, which we perceive to be a normal way of bringing up children. But when you start considering uh, trauma and uh, how to bring up emotionally resilient and emotion, emotionally aware children, then maybe that's not the best thing to do. Um, and for example, if you've had a child that maybe has uh, had some, experienced some loss or some stress um, and they need that somebody else and they're acting out and then they're told to go away, they're not learning how to uh, process, work through their emotions and, and know they're allowed to express them. And certainly when I grew up a long, long time ago, uh, it very much was sent, sent to your room, don't be angry don't be a baby, uh, you know, if you couldn't be heard because everybody else was loud, then you just shut up. Um, all these things that might seem small and it's just part of growing up, they can end up being far more than that. And might, we might call them small T's, but they can just as easily have an impact later in life um, as the bigger traumas as well. Yeah, just following that path through from the child that's maybe told to you know when they express anger or frustration at a situation that they are isolated or disciplined or left alone abandoned mm -hmm. how that can track through into the adult who is maybe angry about something at work and unable to speak up and doesn't doesn't say anything and so they're repressing that that anger and maybe pleasing others and so they're not they're not listening to the that inner voice okay. or well, believe so they're not allowed to show anger so they've learned yes. unconsciously to shut down the anger and they might get the headache or a back pain but not know it's related to being angry with the boss for example yeah exactly exactly and those feelings of anger then become mm -hmm. like this is dangerous if i'm mm -hmm. angry and i express anger then maybe i'm going to be left on my own or i'm going to be isolated or disciplined and so i repress it I push it down and then that triggers this danger alert signaling in the body and can show up like you say like the headache or the, yeah. the the tummy upset or whatever yeah so when we start looking at conditions whether it's pelvic conditions or any conditions one of the important things to do is look at the predisposition for that person developing a condition so as well as looking at what was going on at the time when the condition came on and what are the triggering factors what placed you in a position to be more likely to develop that condition. And that could be something in childhood. It could be just long periods of stress and exhaustion, uh, you know, just feeling low, anxiety, depression, all these other things that it's worth actually considering uh, as well as actually what did trigger the pain or yeah. condition, whatever it is. So, okay, we have a question here. I'm going to pass on for these. So I presume that's not your real name, but Circle Spinner. <laughs> Uh, thank you for doing this. I've read many of the books, listened to many of the podcasts, have a pretty good understanding of the science of chronic pain. The characteristics of my pain ticks many boxes. However, the fact that my arm, wrist pain and temperature changes kicked off a week after having a mild case of COVID eight months ago, it gives me a seed of doubt in thinking there's nothing wrong. Um, <clears throat> is there science that might explain why um, a mild infection could trigger... I've just got chronic... Uh, got yeah, chronic. I was just trying to to tap yeah. it to see if I can open up the rest yeah, of, the, of the question. Oh, wait a minute. No, all we've got is a chronic. Yeah. No. Maybe she's, he, she stopped at that point. Um, yeah. Anyway, uh, do you want to respond to that first, Kay? Yeah. So, um, firstly, um, the, the, the information, so what we know is that when we have a virus, when we get sick this is also a stress on the body this is also impacts us in a in a way it causes stress um and so we can treat this as potentially one of those triggering incidences i don't know what what your thoughts are on that georgie yeah and, and again it's predis health. predisposition is for example you can have 10 people in a lift or who have um covid let's say um uh, sorry one who has covid the other nine won't necessarily all get COVID. And it very much depends, again, on the predisposition. How disposed were we to go down with infection? And if we have had past trauma, if we are stressed and running around and busy, 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 
then we, are, we reduce our immune system. We're more likely to, to go down with an infection. So all these things do play a part. Um, <clears throat> there, it is, there is a current study going on by Dr. Michael Donino, who's in our field with uh, some of his colleagues, looking at long COVID, for example, um, mm -hmm. and uh, using this approach with people with long COVID. And there are certainly many people who have recovered from long COVID using this approach, for example. Um, and uh, temperature changes play just as much a part in, in this as pain. Uh, in fact, talking about temperature changes, um, because we also talked earlier about hormones, I'm going off topic slightly, circle spinner, but if you've got anything in particularly else that you want to ask, do, and we can come back to it anyway. Um, but yes, yeah, so we were talking about pelvic issues, and I know earlier, Kerry, you were talking to me about hormone issues, so menopause, menstruation, um, pre perimenopause, and again, there have been uh, links with past trauma um, with people with those as well. Not, it doesn't mean that everybody with endometriosis or polycystic um, syndrome or whatever, ovary syndrome, etc., have had childhood trauma, um, but there certainly were factors that predisposed them to to develop those. But I remember back in my also, training, I think, sorry, just to oh, say for those people that do have it, if you haven't tried this work, if you haven't had done a, a mind body approach to it, then then there might be some benefit to be had from looking at it in this different way. Absolutely, because we're whole persons. We're not just a physical body, you know, mm -hmm. and. Things, we all are aware, you know, if somebody, um, we suddenly have this fear that we've forgotten something or even worse, that, um, I don't know, something's happened to our children. We have a visceral response, don't we? Um, yeah. So we're all aware of that. It was just a thought and it create, triggered an emotion that then created a response in our body. So we all have that and we cannot separate emotions from our physical body or the mind from our physical body or the mind from our emotions or the spirit, our spirit, you know, it, we are all lots of different parts of a whole person. Uh, and that's why I feel like you said, you know, you, if people have uh, been given a diagnosis, maybe endometriosis or perimenopause or whatever, the likelihood is that the medical people that they've seen have not asked them have you ever experienced any uh, trauma or times in your life when you felt unsupported, for example? There are ways of asking these questions. Um, probably because they're not aware of the research, even though, because the, some of the research shows that, shows that it takes 20 years before the research that's been shown to be in the, at the clinical interface. So even though the evidence is there, it's not. And it has answer. been there in this particular yes. field, hasn't it, Georgie, for more yeah. than 15 years now, I think we are. Yeah, yeah. So, so we're close. Yes. <laughs> we're, we're close. It's becoming mainstream. <laughs> and it, and it, it, things are changing, there's no doubt yeah. about it. But sadly, despite the fact that the other mm. Chartered Experiences studies, for example, that came out in the late 1990s, mm. showed a link between heart disease, uh, autoimmune conditions, chronic pain, all the... Uh, um, or, or loads of other conditions who in the nhs in the medical world in these different areas would actually ask that question have you experienced trauma and yet that's been out for years and years um yeah. and i hope it will gradually come into um, become more understood but if you let's say your endometriosis or your back pain or anything is integrally integrally integral Anyway, linked. We know what you mean. <laughs> yeah, with uh, that condition, and it's not even considered, then that could be a reason why, um, and, and not just that, but not sort of processed, and it's not been considered to then be able to work through that, then that might be stopping people from actually ending up being able to recover or even uh, ease yeah. some of the symptoms. And, and also this, um, this belief that it's just inevitable this kind of inevitability of um, hormone or perimenopause or symptoms and mm. and also the fear around it. So yes. it's yeah. just this kind of idea that it's just a part of getting older. I have to accept it. There's nothing that I can do. And um, beliefs. Yeah, this, this will hold us stuck as well. Yeah. Huh? 
So these faulty beliefs, these myths that hold us back. I remember when I came across this work 15 years ago, so my husband then was only, it was in mid forties. I remember telling him about prostatitis and do not assume that just because you get older, you're gonna have problems with, with your prostate. <laughs> <laughs> I hope he doesn't mind me saying this. Um, <laughs> but I didn't want that belief to be there. Yeah. But actually, you know, you get older, like so many of our friends have, because we're now in our 60s. Um, and thankfully, no, he's not had any problems at the moment, but uh, up to this point. But I think it because beliefs, these myths hold us back and we have to let those go. Um, and I was, so we we're talking about. Um, uh, t temperature change um, and uh, first of all I want to just just notice first of all hello Alex um, nice to see you here and also Phil um, you answered my question I also got married the week after Covid so I had a lot going on absolutely that will yes. and you got a week married a week after so oh my goodness and then the worry about actually being fit enough to be there and letting other people allowing other people to be there as well so the huge stress um, around yeah that. I mean the stress of getting married during COVID times during any times uh, yes yeah. <laughs> I mean it's stressful getting married in itself huh yeah. but getting married yeah. during COVID times um uh, yes yeah. that that I can see That's how that could enough. absolutely yeah. be a trigger yeah absolutely mm. um so going back to um hormones, perimenopause, menopause. My personal belief is if you have developed perimenopause symptoms, yes, there are other factors involved and, you know, um, dietary concerns, uh, nutritional stuff, etc. cetera. Um, but the, the main thing I tend to uh, talk about, the reason I talk about stress and unprocessed, unresolved emotions is that that's usually what's missed. You know, the past trauma and every most People, when you go in, uh, if you have perimenopausal symptoms or menopausal symptoms, they'll talk about supplements and diet and things like that. But how many in the medical world would actually ask you about emotions, uh, about unresolved emotions, about trauma? Very few. Um, and I remember when, uh, in my training many years ago, um, that actually uh, we were taught that the hypothalamus in the brain was the conductor of the or uh, orchestra. It was in charge of every single thing that goes on in the body. And stress affects the hypothalamus. And we know that uh, any system in the body can develop sy um, symptoms, uh, you know, mind-body symptoms. And this is the same with menopausal symptoms. Um, and so I would definitely be querying if somebody has perimenopausal symptoms, okay, you know, what's going on? What can you, uh, you know, start considering that and treating it as a back pain or as any other pain? Um, and I mean, I'm 62 now. And when I initially, I have to admit, when I started going through the menopause, I was thinking, oh, that's okay. Because, well, I assumed I was going through the menopause um, uh, because I didn't have any symptoms at first. And I just thought, oh, it's all that I'm doing. I've been processing everything for the past, etc. Uh -huh. Anyway, I then began to get hot flushes. And that was the only symptom really that I had going through the menopause. Um, but then I very quickly realized that when I had a hot flush, it's usually when I woke up in the morning, absolutely fine. And then suddenly some sort of thought popped into my mind that triggered. I was just uh, about to ask you, like, yeah, what, what you know, was happening? Yeah, so it's usually work-based. Before the hot flush. About or uh, concerned about or whatever. Uh, and, and I remember posting that in our global group that we have uh, many, many years ago. And a, a lot of the women on the group replied and said, yes, they experienced the same. All the men stayed very quiet. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> but it, that has been the case and occasionally I still do get a hot flush but it is very occasional and it is always when there's something going on that I'm not um, dealing with it's an uh, unresolved emotion that might be triggered in the moment but at least now I know what I can do about it and I'm sure the understanding stopped it from getting worse so in my personally I really do believe that there's so much we can do with this work to help people with perimenopausal and menopausal symptoms as well yeah and just a bit of my story as well around this because actually when I was in my early 30s so after my my first child was born I 
um, was seeing a doctor about lots of different things that were going on, lots of different symptoms before I came across this work. And um, one of the things that we did was we did a lot of hormone tests mm -hmm. and they came back that I was not ovulating. And her response was that you, you, you're in perimenopause actually looking at you know from the from from the charts this is yes you know, this is what's going on for you and it was very scary for me because yes. I, was, I was young and um and i had chronic pain and i was you know i was young and then things were incredibly stressful i was going through an incredibly stressful time prolonged period of stress and that on top of um quite you know some stresses during childhood and things like that as well and now um so after doing this work and so I, I went on the normal routes of the um supplements and changing diet and all of those things but actually after doing this work i then got on to have another two children and, and completely reversed that perimenopause and so now I'm, I'm 39 coming into my 40s and and my hormones are, are very um stable and nowhere lots better than they were in my early 30s so yes. yeah Fabulous. so you could go on and have loads more kids if you want yeah, <laughs> I'll try. <him. laughs> yes, do you know what? Uh, my my husband would love more children. I keep saying, just you know, have to wait now for grandchildren. To wait for the grandchildren. But yeah. I used to, even now, occasionally, just for a joke, if I knock on his office door to say something, I'll say, "Guess what?" And he'll go, "You're pregnant." <laughs> <laughs> no, can you imagine going back to all that? No, thank you. <laughs> that would be really great advertising for this work, wouldn't it? <laughs> <laughs> Could somebody else please do that rather than me, though? <laughs> do we have another question? Um, yes, yes. Down to Alison, do you want to leave that one out? So, oh, it's just moved. Oh, yes. uh, one second. Um, so, Alison is just saying here that um, having had an assessment with SERPA practitioner, she identified that by extreme back pain came on six to 12 months after I lost my dad. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, my support never considered grief body connection. Yeah, absolutely. Mm -hmm. Alison. This is really, yes. um, grief is a really strong emotion and, um, it can absolutely show up in the body as symptoms. Yeah, absolutely. And, and in fact, they talk this talk last month, um, with Teresa and Tanya was about grief and about encouraging people to talk about grief. Um, and yeah, absolutely. In fact, ha Dr. Howard Chubro said publicly that when his um, father died, I think he got back pain. And when his mother died, he got neck pain. Uh, mm -hmm. And you can understand why. Absolutely. Because people, especially when people think, oh, you, after time, you get over it. You know, I've lost my father. No, you don't. There, there'll be time. Most of the time, I'm absolutely fine. But sometimes something will trigger it. Um, and mm -hmm. most of the time, people think, "Well, it's, for me, it's three and a half years ago. You shouldn't be still upset." Doesn't matter. I could sometimes remember my grandfather who died just after I turned twenty-two, um, and that can bring up an emotion occasionally. And it's about yeah. allowing that to be there and being okay. You know, we grieve because we loved, and therefore we should allow ourselves to feel that. And when we don't grieve and when we don't allow these emotions, every loss that we experience can show up in our body. So whether it be that we just lost our keys or something, you know, or, you know, then this, we don't understand why am I so, why am I reacting? So upset. Yes. Yeah, so upset yes. that, that I've lost this thing or that, um, yeah. Yeah. So, we, uh, so it's like a theme in your life, isn't it? You know, mm. whether it's loss, um, something like that, whether it's uh, abandonment. Abandonment mm. can be something that maybe we experienced as a child, but maybe somebody not replying to your WhatsApp message uh, might trigger that. You feel abandoned because they've not bothered to reply. I've had to learn that myself, and I realized, you know, the, the youngsters, especially, they have so many messages coming in all the time, and they might see it, but then they just get, can't ignore it to carry on with other things at the time, and then they forget to go back to it. Um, and, and we call it all sorts of things these days, don't we? we? We give it all these names and create these labels, like if somebody's, oh, oh you've been ghosted, or, you know, I hear the, 
young people talk about these things and we, we give it such a negative connotation, whereas actually it might be that they just were busy and they didn't see it. Yeah. And so we take it very, very personally. Yeah. And this can be because of all of those past experiences that haven't haven't been processed. Yeah. And again, um, it's that awareness and understanding, rationalizing it, turning it round, so that we can then uh, experience, process it ourselves. And I, I'm sure everybody has come to a point where they actually have felt that. Then they find that actually, no, that person was didn't see it, or they something happened, and it was nothing about us. It was about. Well, they them. started to write a response. I've done this many times. You start to write a response, and then something distracts you. And in your brain, you you, you think you've said it, yes. And then a week later, you go back to your messages and realise that it's still sat there and having not been sent. So absolutely, yeah, that, that's absolutely. happened to me many times. Okay, so let's move on. We've got Amanda. I've suffered chronic pain for ten months in my back, and now realise the mind body connection. Uh, I had a period of shaking, uh, shaking some months back, and found it very strange. But now it makes sense. Thank you. Mm, yes, it's, it's really weird. If you they do they do uh, apart from TRE, there's a shaking meditation that they do as well. It was developed in Bali, um, mm -hmm. and that's just standing up, and it's just uh, starting yourself to shake and just allowing yourself to shake. Yes, shaking yes. the bones. I've heard this this term before, where you shake the bones. And uh, yeah, this standing meditation and sometimes to music as well can be very, um, yes. can help to move things. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. Mm. I'm Susan Millers. Uh, as a 61 year old, I'm wondering if my back stiffness and discomfort is expected because of OA. I totally get the mind body linked to chronic pain, but wondering if my pain is emotional or age related. I think that's an interesting one because arthritis is a normal part of aging. Um, and I'm a little older than you are, Susan, and I might have the odd day when I'm really achy. The rest of the time, I'm absolutely fine. Um, I'm also interested when I do boot camp, um, and uh, I do a commander fit boot camp outdoors, and sometimes it's quite tough. And it's interesting that the following day or 48 hours later, there'll be times in the day when I'm more achy than other times. Uh, and I know I started recognizing it's what's going on in here and how I'm feeling, and um, not just what I'm actually doing physically. So arthritis is a normal part of aging, um, and I would suggest that the stiffness and discomfort is this is going to be a, a you know getting older yes of course we're not as fit and healthy but i would put most of it down to certainly for me i put most of that down to um, how i'm feeling and not just getting older when you see what some of these older people are doing and and, and some of them are very um, fit and healthy uh, and don't have any pain and that's i think that's the thing it's just you'll get some 60 60 odd year olds who ha are achy and some who aren't at all um, and it's not related to how much arthritis they have exactly as just about yeah absolutely so we can see on scans and x-rays that someone might have terrible changes and terrible arthritic yeah. changes um, but no pain and somebody might have not much change at all and and not much pain uh, one of our colleagues within serpa um, she told me a story about her dad and they went to the doctors about his knees, about the arthritis in his knees and having a knee replacement. And the doctor came out and he's very certain. He said, yep, yeah, we're going to have to replace that left knee. And he said, well, but it's my right knee that hurts. And so <laughs> just from looking at the scans, it looked like the left knee had terrible changes and would need replacing. But actually, in when when you talk to the, the, the patient, when... Yes. that knee and so often it can be our expectation as well i think yeah. of, um you know when we um you know we we, we expect it it's like arthritis I'm getting older. Now, and changes therefore pain and stiffness and so changing yeah. our expectations around it um yeah and our beliefs around it and the fear around it kind of being like okay this is how it is but knowing that it's not constant it's going to change it's going to mm. change and Begin, beginning to become more aware of how your emotions and what's going on in your life in general is affecting. So I have this strange thing in my elbow. My elbow tells me when I'm stressed. So <laughs> when I'm, I'm feeling a little bit stressed, I get this terrible kind of um, sensation, I'm going to call it, in my elbow that where I don't want to lean on it. If I lean on it, if my clothes rub on it, it feels very strong sensation 
and I only notice it when it's there. <laughs> so, and um, and you know, most of the time it's not there at all, and it kind of, and then when it when it's there, I go, oh, okay, what do I need to look at? What do I? And it's just a signal. It's like a barometer, isn't it? You mm. know, and none of us are perfect. We're not going to all deal with everything going on in our lives mm. all the time. Sometimes it's just not possible when there's so much going on. But at least it's a reminder for us to, okay, let's focus on me. Let me look after me. Um, yeah, it's the body's communicating. It's beautiful, really. Yeah, absolutely. So it, so it communicates with us, keeps yes. us safe. So Lauren says, I'm really enjoying this approach, taking Dr. Uh, Schubiner training and stuffs today. Great. This perspective mm. has shifted my practice and allows me to support my clients on a whole other level. Absolutely, Lauren. Right. It's a wonderful approach. And, and one of the reasons I love it is that it's not just us helping clients, it's us working on ourselves as well. Absolutely. It's a lifelong journey. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. And it's like just how it work, it's never it's done. You've got to have pain. <laughs> I think that's important for people to recognise because I've had patients who've said, you know, well, how come you get the pain or whatever? Because mm. it's the signal. We ha we all are parts of a whole and, you know, we it's the human experience to experience stress. And when there's a lot going on in your life, maybe you can't keep up with it all. Um, but the main thing is not to go into the fear around it and focus on it and try to fix it, uh, you know, which are ways to actually ramp up the pain, excessive focus on the pain. Um, so, yeah, I think yeah. it's it's about recognising this is normal. It's just not it's being able to carry on with your life and not get drawn into it and start with a real worry. And going, going back to the arthritis as well, reminded me of a um, the husband of a friend of mine who post-surgery, um, severe surgery, um, ended up with, within a week started getting uh, groin pain and then within a couple of weeks developed severe hip pain uh, and started losing movement. So function was impaired, severe pain, uh, really uh, an obvious hip, uh, arthritic hip pattern. Um, and when he, he went for an x-ray, it showed that he had no cartilage. It was bone on bone, no cartilage in that hip. They did the other hip as well, and they found there was nearly no cartilage. There was very little cartilage in that hip. He never, ever had problem in that, a problem in that hip. Uh, he was at the time in his early 60s, I think, um, and he had bone on bone on the one that had pain. But three or four weeks earlier, he'd had no pain. He'd never had pain. He'd never had loss of movement. Arthritis like that takes years to come around. But that, I'm not going to go into the story behind it, but that was a significant thing, thing him having surgery and the impact that had on him, his life, uh, how he perceived himself, etc. And it was really interesting. It was it was at the time when I was I had only literally, oh no, it was before I came across Dr. Sana's work. And I remember when I came across it, I went, oh, now I understand. So it was like 20 years yeah. ago. But really yeah. interesting. And also the language that we use around, you know, I hear this a lot of patients saying, you know, bone on bone. This yes. kind of, it's very, very that so painful, doesn't it? Like, yes. Oh. Whereas, like you say, you know, this has been like this for years. This takes yeah. years, decades to develop. Absolutely. Yeah, the pain is new. So it's therefore, it's, it's not the bone on bone or, you know. Yeah. Uh, it, it, like you say, it's about then changing your language around yeah. that. You know, your spine's... Uh, disintegrating. Yes. Uh, oh, oh my collapsing. God. Or crumbling, collapsing. Crumbling. Yeah. Is that? And then you get to move. So, of course, you've got fear and focusing on it and <laughs> desperate to yeah. get rid of it, all these things that ramp up the pain. So, as Alison uh, oh, Susie said, uh, abandonment is a big one. Thank you for mm. mentioning it. Yeah, absolutely. It's a huge one, Susie. Um, absolutely yeah. huge. And it can be perceived as so many little things that are happening in our lives. and it, But each time, it's worth considering, and, and it's been one for me as well, as someone who was sent to boarding school, um, and it's, I still get triggered, uh, but it's about now, it's about noticing, being aware when that, it's, for me, it's not pain, it's, uh, 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 it's like going into um, the freeze response, so it, rather than mm. fight or flight, it's just a, ugh, and a real sort of low mood and a heaviness within me, but um, but less than it used to be, and I'm able to get over it much quicker. I mean, it would have been gone for a while in the early days, um, but the recognition and then the being able to process it is the important thing, but it doesn't mean I'm never triggered, but it takes more to trigger me. I don't go down as low and I don't stay there as long, but it's still there. Yeah, yeah absolutely. 
Alison says, um, yes, my partner's mum was taken to hospital when he was a young child and no one explained why. He knows he is terrified of being abandoned. Yeah, this confusion as children, yes. you know, they, of uh, when we were talking about loss before and relative dying, uh, it made me think about, um, you know, when we lose a relative when we're a young child and nobody, we kind of protected. It, yes. You know, we're protected from it and we, people don't talk about it. And and that can be detrimental because we're confused. We don't understand, well, what happened? Yes. What happened? Um, so that's really, yeah, really important when when young children experience loss or trauma or grief that that we explain what's going on and, and it's interesting because when my father died three and a half years ago my um niece has three young children and they were all very young at the time and i think my great nephew was two um and he used to he would took this whenever he saw my mother he would talk about my father um i'm trying to remember what he called him um I know what he calls my mother but uh it was some strange name but anyway uh he would mention him and he'd say something like gone or you know i don't think he actually said died but he said he'd say gone and other things and his mum is an amazing mother really really on board with all this and and understanding about the importance of treating children in, as individuals not treating them all the same and helping them express their emotions and feel big emotions um and it was really lovely because it was about allowing him to um, ask questions or in the way he could or the girls to be able to offload and and in the, it, it sometimes made us laugh when he would say things like that but it's about yeah allowing them to talk about about it whereas in the past it was it was shut down wasn't it people just didn't you didn't go to funerals you didn't talk about it Goodness. yeah yeah children not going to funerals i remember sitting in the car Really? During, during funerals, yeah, during the burial part and things anyway. Yes, yeah. yes. I and just wanted to touch on actually, um, it's something that uh, we talked about loss and we've talked about grief and about hormones. And I really feel like one thing um, is miscarriage, the trauma of, of the loss of, yeah. um, of a pregnancy. And just talking about children there, I recently had a miscarriage. And um, yeah, so and going through that process so now being aware of this work and understanding mm -hmm. at the time i had just literally it was the day after moving house oh, and the, a few days before the children were returning to school and they had new schools to go to and we you know it was yeah a lot going on at that time and i said to myself like i can't process this grief right now because it's there's just too much going on so I'm going to put it away for a moment, survive. I'm going to go into survival mode because I just yeah. need to get through this next few weeks. Um, and then and then I'll deal with it. And so of course, well, you're not doing that. <laughs> and so then, of course, the weeks went, went by and I was like, OK, I maybe I need maybe need to look at this. Symptoms started to arise and I started to realize how how this not dealing with it was affecting my body. And so I went back. To deal with it but i've become over the years you know we get very good at suppressing emotions and so then when you want to go back and to deal with it it's not that easy to yeah. to to bring these things up and so um and then and so working in lots of different ways and stuff i i was able to um to do that but it's an ongoing process and um my i've got you know a little girl and she's four and and the children knew that i was pregnant and so my little girl and she drew on the walls. So, so after this, she was drawing on the walls. And when you look at this picture, she draws herself and her little brother and her older brother and me, and then this like little egg. Um, and so she was expressing herself and her grief through what immediately was like, oh my gosh, you're drawing on the walls. Um, but then when I was able to look at it and, and realize, okay, this is really a loss for her yes yes uh, yeah so wow. just to just to bring that into it as well because so many women are going through this grief mm. and you know many going back to work very soon or like i i was in the in the thick of it 
and so mm -hmm. you're not able to stop so yes. yeah just wanting to mention that to people yeah. that it's okay to stop and process better to process it there and then mm -hmm. rather than to try and bring it back later yes yeah, mm. yeah absolutely i think that's important um okay let's move on um david by all means ask a question um and then going back to uh where are we on i think it's alex now um absolutely yeah. i'm on past six months ago and after a three year uh, well, sorry to hear that alex um but after a three year illness and i had a new flare up the day before her funeral of pelvic pain and i'm still trying to work through it but yeah grief is definitely going to react um your nervous system nervous system yes absolutely. absolutely and it takes time to process it um it's it can be tough um it can be really tough and it can take time and especially with grief and especially with a parent mm. you know it's... what are some of the because people will be watching this and they'll be hearing us talk about grief and ways of processing it and maybe giving them some ideas actually of ways in which are that we've found effective for people to mm -hmm. process grief might be um might be nice for some people well one yeah. one thing i would suggest is go and watch the recording from last month with tanya and Teresa because they talk talk about that. Tanya very clearly explains some of the things she did. So it might be that they could do that. Um, but certainly journaling, talking to a trusted friend, TRE, um, yes. you know, allowing yourself to work work through these emotions and not not to stuff it down, not to if you're feeling emotional, to actually, okay, maybe take yourself off somewhere, but allow yourself um, to show an emotion. So you have to show your emotions rather than feeling that oh I'm supposed to have got over it by now. Um, mm. But so what would you suggest, Kerry? Yeah, absolutely. Um, writing found very helpful. So journaling and writing letters. So letters to yeah. your loved ones that you've lost. Letters to yourself. So if it was a long time ago, letter to yourself back. Can then. I also say we talk about letters um, when my father died? Um, writing a letter to from my younger self to him when I when we were young, as well as writing a letter from me to him um, now. Um, so I, I want to, I found it brought up stuff from the past that I wanted to process. Um, but then I and I still write to him occasionally if I'm wanting. He he'd be the person I'd pick up the phone and ring and just say, you know, I've got this issue going on. What what do you suggest? And often by writing. Uh, still then and then let him reply to me it's like I get an answer because I know it's the sort of thing he would have said um, and uh, it can be just really helpful so generally I think can be a really good thing and also um, kind of a process of um, I like to I call it like an I am so you know I am sad and like writing this I am sad I am lonely I am angry and and working with one of those statements so really writing them down and then going back and being like oh I'm sad and then feeling into like what is that sadness where is it taking me and maybe it brings up a memory that's yeah. quite unexpected so oh there was that time when I felt so sad mm and and then just working with that and it's like mm, breathing into that and forgiving yourself for really holding on to that sadness and giving yourself permission to to release it now and that might be in the form of some tears in the form of um you know some more words on the page or speaking something out yeah that, that, those are things i found helpful yeah excellent because for many people it's it's not just uh grief due to loss uh, from loving someone, but there's grief, but there's also mixed emotions because maybe there was a really challenging relationship. Um, mm -hmm. And this can be a real opportunity to actually work through those emotions. Um, yeah. And uh, and again, journaling can help with that. Yeah, um, we were talking about COVID earlier, and this was a, a real strong emotion that was coming up for a lot of people um, when when we were all isolated from each other this feeling of grief of loss of, yes. of that life that we used to live of of our friends of our connections of the work yeah. as we knew it all of this yeah absolutely yeah okay so susan says i susan. think i'll shift my expectations around oa uh, and continue to work continue to work on emotions i'm starting to work with a practitioner fabulous susan so right. hopefully, yeah, this will be the start of wonderful things to come uh, and Alison, my mum has not discussed dad's loss. Um, replacement knee came out with pneumonia and died. Oh, that's sad. Oh. She is so much old school, uh, can't and won't process publicly, so we cannot discuss. 
Alison, that's similar to my mother, although she does want to talk about my father a lot, about how much she misses him, um, and they were together for 64 years. Um, but she is very much old school, um, would never openly, uh, would never want to cry in front of people. It takes a lot for her to really show her vulnerability, but has grown up just shutting down and not showing how she feels. Uh, so I understand that. And that's really hard. And we can only be there for them. Uh, and if they aren't able to uh, offload or follow any suggestions, then all we can do there is be there for them, basically. Mm. Um, Alison says, I'll definitely look at that last video. Yes. Great. So David's got a question here. Um, I just cannot fully accept my condition is TMS. Mm -hmm. I have... Uh, oh, I can't pronounce that. Ella's Sandler syndrome. Mm -hmm. syndrome. Yeah, I know it. I just can't pronounce it. Which <laughs> brings things like bone yes. loss in the jaw, <laughs> severe receding gums, connective tissue, fragile skin issues, low immune function, severe fatigue, etc. I have read countless recovery stories, all Sano books, etc. I have now got the free trial SERPA. But for the life of me, I will not let my brain accept that my Ehlers Danlos syndrome is TMS. Help. What is stopping my brain? Perhaps I need a practitioner to really understand. And then it, and, and then it, and then I assume it says what, you know, what's going on for me yes. right now. Yeah. I mean, firstly, I, I would say we wouldn't say um, EDS is TMS um, because it's an autoimmune condition. So we can't just say it's specifically TMS. Having said that, we know that autoimmune conditions are a common, uh, a lot of people with autoimmune conditions had childhood trauma, big T's or, or little T's. And we also know that we are a whole person with all parts of us. So if you're treating um, EDS as a, um, a physical condition without considering other things, then you will be limited in how you can progress. So I would suggest it might be easier for you to follow this approach by considering how will this help my symptoms of EDS? Um, you know, we would say, for example, on the hypermobility side that um, chronic pain from EDS, that definitely is TMS. If you dislocate a joint, it's painful, but when it's back in, the pain settles down. We know that the pain settles. If pain continues then uh, and becomes chronic, then that becomes neural circuits that become learned and sensitized. Um, so, but EDS in itself is not a TMS condition, but absolutely this approach could could really help you. And I think looking at it in that way could help. Um, the other thing about, uh, I would suggest if you're saying um, perhaps you need a practitioner, um, certainly the program will really help you get a much deeper understanding. Um, and uh, one of the uh, uh, videos on the recovery on the recovery program is about breath work and, it, and Lorna Nicholson does that and Lorna actually specializes in POTS and fatigue conditions and uh, um, EDS so it might be worth you finding her details from the SERPA find a practitioner page the directory um, and she will be able to definitely help you with that um, but treating it as how can you use a mind-body approach to help calm symptoms down and maybe do a lot more but not saying EDS is TMS. No wonder you're stuck, uh, David. I was yeah. And um, one thing that um, I find really helpful is to do a timeline um, for yourself to really plot it on a timeline from when you were born all the way up until the present day, and all of the events that took place, all of the stresses, any um, significant life events, and then plotting on when you got your diagnosis and when or when symptoms um, occurred. Started or like, Yeah, just starting mm -hmm. to see the correlations between your emotions and your stress and your symptoms. And and yeah, and certainly trying some of these things without this um, without having too much pressure on yourself to to um, you know to put it all down to one thing. We often want to to label it very neatly as one thing yeah. or another thing, but we are complex human beings yeah. and we're, there's so many different influences that's going on. And if you're trying to fix something, um, that's yeah. another thing. Fixing mentality. Yeah. <laughs>
we are coming to the end now so we can just i just wanted to say um, david does say that he has childhood trauma constant fight or flight yeah, yeah. and the char personality characteristics yeah definitely so worth speaking with somebody uh, david because often a lot of this is unconscious unconscious programming unconscious personality traits beliefs behaviors when you start it can be helpful to work with somebody who can reflect back what's going on and to help you maybe get into the body more somatically do a bottom-up approach which actually for somebody who's living in fight or flight can feel very threatening so therefore mm -hmm. working with somebody could help you um, with that yeah um, having that co-regulation from from a practitioner and that that yeah. element of safety definitely definitely so no wonder you have fear with that david and i think that's definitely showing that you would uh, benefit from that one-to-one -one support with somebody and just finishing with uh, Alec thank you both for your expertise a fellow TMS coach here hello there I'm mm -hmm. curious if you have a, a go-to approach for a client who has le uh, learned from a very young age that it's not okay to be angry there's a conscious acknowledgement that anger is being repressed but almost refusal to go there and experience the emotion um, I, I would basically say this is about a bottom-up approach. This is about, first of all, learning to feel safe um, and to feel safe with emotions. So pendulating, um, you know, this is, this is trauma. This is working with a trauma response. Um, learning to pendulate in and out of an emotion, learning to become emotionally aware, to build your interception, your felt sense. Um, and, uh, and when emotion and anger comes up, if it starts coming up, then before you get to the point where you can't deal with it, I would be suggesting learning that self-soothing, finding resources that help you learn to bring it down again, to ground yourself, calm breathing, whatever that happens to be to self-soothe, um, and then go back again and start noticing it. And so you learn then that it is safe to do that until gradually your tolerance, your window of tolerance increases. Um, and that could be with any any emotion. Um, anything to add on to that? So I'm trying to be quick here because we. Have yeah, no. So just very, very quickly. Um, I would also uh, find uh, writing uh, about the anger. So I am angry because I'm angry that I'm mm -hmm. angry with, and um, sometimes in order to feel safe to write these things, because that can even feel you know that someone might see it. Um, writing over, so writing and then going back to the beginning of that line and then writing over that. So it's completely, yeah. no one could read it, no one could yeah. find it, even if, you know, and so that, that can be a nice way to, to work with it. Yeah, definitely. And I just want to allay your fears, David. Uh, you say the mention of somatic scares the hell out of you. Actually, do you know what? Somatic approach can be a really lovely way to go. And the trauma research now <coughs> is showing that actually if you, talk therapy, especially if you've got PTSD, for example, can re-traumatize. The, th the thoughts in the past was that you talk about your trauma, the more you talk about it, the more it sort of calms things down, you get used to it, but that's not the case. You're being re-traumatized. A somatic approach is learning to be in your body to start, like I mentioned earlier about pendulating. Pause, breathe, feel reassured, ground yourself, allow yourself to just start to feel an emotion. And this is where working with somebody with experience in the somatic fields would be helpful and we have quite a few practitioners now who have done um you know training like in body processing uh, somatic experiencing uh ifs the internal family systems which works within your your capabilities and your uh without being too threatening honestly it's yeah. a it's a very safe way to work um you will with tre as well um, yeah, TRE. You're, you're not you're not thinking about the trauma or talking about it. It's you're allowing the body to, to do yeah, its thing. Absolutely. So there are ways, David, without it um, uh, being a scary thing. And yes, the increase in pain will be because these things are surfacing and your brain's going, no, 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 no. can't deal with this, can't deal with this. <laughs> Okay, we are going to have to stop now. Sorry. Yeah, it's been fascinating. It's yeah, fascinating, Alison says. It's been yeah. such a great talk. Yeah, mm. thank you for being here, everybody, because it's made it so much more interesting being able to uh, talk to you all and have your comments as well. So thank you very much, and we will thank you. Um, record this and put this up. And then if you've got any queries, by all means, uh, get in touch with the office or get in touch with Kerry. Kerry's details, you'll, you'll put your website on the... Yeah, website. I'll pop in the comments and stuff where people can find me. Yeah, lovely. Okay, nice Thank to you. hear from you all. Thanks very much. <laughs> bye. Bye-bye.